Good morning, everyone. So glad that you've tuned in with us again. So sad that we can't see each other and feel each other's presence, but it's just good to know that you're there. It's important that families stay together and it's important that church families stay together, even when we're forced to be apart. This is Palm Sunday and the prophet Zechariah forecast and wrote about this. He wrote these words. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Let us praise God.
We thank you that you set your face to Jerusalem, knowing what awaited you there, that after the cheers and hosannas, it was scourging and beating and mocking and jeering and the cry, crucify, crucify. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the love that took you to the cross, that you went there willingly for us, that you took the punishment that was ours, we thank you, Lord, with all our hearts. But Father, we confess that in spite of tasting the freedom of salvation, the joy of your presence, we still thought, fall so far short of what and who you want us to be. We ask you to forgive us for the things we say and do that hurt other people and grieve you. We ask you to forgive us for the things we omit to do and say that we should be doing and saying. We confess that we revert to our old nature too often. But Father God, we rejoice that in, in that eternal forgiveness that was purchased by the blood of Christ. And we thank you for the victory that was won when death could not defeat you and when an empty tomb was found on Easter morning. Lord, we would enter into that victory that we would be strong servants, faithful disciples, recognising that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is within us. So Father, make us true Easter people, victorious people, not limping along, but living a life of joy and power in you through our living Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue in our study of Isaiah, and we continue in chapter 43, reading from verse 16. So we hear God's word. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honour me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wasteland and streams in the desert to give drink to my people my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob, you have not wearied yourselves for me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honoured me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, or wearied you with demands for incense. You have not brought any fragrant calamus for me, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins, and wearied me with your offences. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and remember your sins no more.
is 93 years old. And she has the most amazing memory. The last time I was with her, she recounted a time during the war when English and American soldiers were stationed on their land and had a lookout tower. She could remember the full name of the sergeant in charge. She knew that subsequently he had been killed in battle and that his father had found their name in his notebook, his diary, and had written to her father thanking them for caring for him. She also remembered with humour how her brother was walking in the lane one day and said to him, that's a brave day. And the soldier replied rather sharply, what's brave about it? With an expletive added. Only someone from County Antrim would know that a brave day is a day that's not too bad weather-wise and has nothing to do with valour or courage. My 93-year-old mother could tell me all about that. And yet when I asked her what she had for dinner the day before or what carer was with her, she couldn't remember. That's how memory works when you're older. The recent past you can remember no more and events of 80 years ago seem like yesterday. You may have discovered this for yourself even though you may not be 93. Memory is a wonderful gift to us. We can relive magical moments in our lives. The birth of our children, our graduation, our first pay packet, an exciting holiday. And even those who have lost loved ones can travel down memory lane and relive some precious times they've had with the person who has gone. This spring, as we drive about the countryside and as far as we're allowed to drive about the countryside, we see those wonderful clumps of yellow daffodils. And even if you're not into poetry, Wordsworth always comes to mind when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. But Wordsworth goes on and he says, And oft when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. In other words, when he lay on his couch, he could relive the joy of that special moment when he was out walking. He could relive it in his memory. Memory is indeed a wonderful gift. We can live and relive precious moments over and over again. But like so many wonderful gifts, memory can work against us. How many people? Many of you live with ghosts. You may even call them demons. That rise up and dance before you and taunt you. The memory of something awful that happened to you that just won't go away. You try to submerge it for the most time. But every so often it pops up to torture you again and again. Maybe it's something you've done and you can't forgive yourself. Maybe it's something terrible that's happened to you. Maybe it's bad news you've had to receive. Memories aren't always good. In Isaiah 43, God is speaking through his prophet. And he says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. It's a very beautiful image. There's the excitement and the anticipation of something new, a fresh, a whole new start. And it seems to be a fertile, productive, 
life-giving new start. The people of Israel would have welcomed those words. They'd been defeated, devastated, taken in exile at the hands of the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. They had disobeyed God time and again and had paid for their foolishness. Yet God is saying to them, forget about all that. In fact, in verses 20 to 23, God lists all the animals who honour him, but not his own people. He lists how they go through the motions of worship, but they weren't truly worshipping him. How they wearied themselves, but not for him. And yet after all that, God says, I will remember your sins no more. I will blot out your transgressions. This is who our God is. His grace and mercy goes out to his own people in spite of their repeated failures. But it isn't just the bad things they are encouraged to forget. In the immediate verses before he says forget the former things, God himself has reminded them of all the good things that he has done for them, bringing them up out of Egypt, opening the sea for them, destroying the might of Pharaoh's chariots and horses. Yet it's immediately after he reminds them of that, that he says, now forget the former things. So is God telling us to forget everything, the good, the bad, forget it all. I believe what God is saying is don't be trapped by the past. Don't be limited by the past. He's saying great things happened to you at my hand. Terrible things happened to you when you turned away from me. But don't let any of that make you miss what I'm doing now. So many Christians miss out on what God is doing in their churches, in their communities, yes, in their own lives, because they're trapped in the past, they can't let it go. The good old days when everything was rosy and perfect, nothing's the same since then, so I'll just live and relive in the past. Or if that's something so terrible, God could never use me, in fact, God could never forgive me. Or look what happened to me. Why did God take my husband? Why my child taken from me? There are lots of questions to which there are no answers. But I know that as God speaks to us today through his word, his message to us is forget the former things. Take a look at what's happening now or you'll miss it. Today is Palm Sunday and how sad it is for me to stand here in an empty church, an empty sanctuary. I always loved Palm Sunday and the Sunday school children waving their palms. It was a delight, a favourite Sunday in the year. Here I am dwelling in the past. The first Palm Sunday was the beginning of something new. It was the day the Son of God set his face towards Jerusalem and embarked on the journey that would lead to him bringing light into a dark world, bringing salvation to humankind. The crowds cheered. They roared with excitement, but we all know what awaited him. And we all know it wasn't long before the Hosannas were changed to crucify, crucify. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. He was going to do something new. 
All the sacrifices that went before us, people came to God with their pigeons and their lambs and their calves, would now be replaced by the one and only sacrifice of the spotless, sinless, perfect Lamb of God. This new thing he would do wouldn't be easy. It wasn't going to be easy according to Isaiah either. The rivers and streams that were promised were in the wilderness and in the desert. And so for Jesus, there would be the wilderness and desert times too. But through him, a new way would be opened up between a holy God and a sinful people. The way was hard. It went from Palm Sunday to Gethsemane to Calvary to the empty tomb. But the price was paid for all who would enter in to what Jesus did. So God's call to you and me today is not to forget the past. But don't let the past imprison you or define you. Leave it behind. Leave behind the good old days. Forget the bad days and see what God will do now. We're all talking about the worldwide event that is happening, this pandemic. What is God saying to us? One thing's for sure. He's saying something to our nations, to our cultures. I wonder will we listen or will we go our own way like the Israelites? But I also know that God is speaking to us and doing something new in us as individuals if we let him. He has given us something very precious these days. I. What will you do with that time? Will you spend time getting to know him better? Getting to know his word? Will you pray? Will you ask him what he wants you to do? Will you leave the past and go on with him now? read a lovely story about a father whose wife died young. He was left with a little boy and he tried very hard to be mum and dad to the little boy and he promised the little boy that he would take him for a picnic. And they worked very hard getting the food ready, they got it into the fridge, they got the picnic basket into the car and then they had to go to bed because the picnic would be tomorrow. So the daddy lay in bed, the little boy arrived and Daddy, I can't sleep. I can't, I just can think about tomorrow and nothing else. The daddy said, I'm sure you are, but you, if you're too tired, you won't enjoy it. Go back and sleep. The little boy went away. Two minutes later, he came back. What is it now, the daddy said? Daddy, thank you for tomorrow. Thank you for tomorrow. Can you step forward with God, trusting in his goodness, trusting him so much that you can say, thank you, Father, for tomorrow and the next day and the one after that. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the joy of simple people and devout believers as they followed our Lord Jesus into Jerusalem. We give thanks that at least for one hour in his mortal life, Jesus was given a little of the praise he deserved. We are thankful for those who cheered him, even if they did not understand the heartache that he was already beginning to suffer. We are grateful for each of those waving tree branches and for every excited and joyful shout of Hosanna. We thank you for the awesome love of Christ. 
which resolutely took him from Palm Sunday into the growing dangers of Holy Week. Loving God, we cannot plumb the depths that lay ahead of Jesus. But we do know it was for us. And for that we are eternally grateful. Give us the grace, loving God, to pray with our hearts as well as with our lips. And to serve with our deeds as well as our prayers. In places today where the church celebrates with joy singing hosannas overflowing from loving hearts. May you be honoured in all their joy. In places where the church gathers in sorrow or fear today, weeping with Christ Jesus for the cross that must be carried in the face of persecution and abuse. May your kingdom come. In places where people are at their wits end, angry or frightened, ready to hit out violently at those around them, or falling into despair, where the loss of a loved one seems too deep. May your comfort be with them. In places where nurses and doctors, and all who support the work in our hospitals, where they work with compassion and risking their very lives, we pray for your courage, and strength and protection. And we pray with so many of our brothers and sisters around the world that this virus would lose its power over us and that many lives would be saved and we could live again with all the freedoms we once enjoyed and will no longer take for granted. Lord our God, we pray your kingdom come in the prayer Jesus taught us as we say it together wherever we are. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May I remind you that today, from 3 to 4, our moderator, along with other church leaders, is calling us to an hour of prayer, especially about this awful virus that has caused such upheaval and to which many have lost their lives.
finish with the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.